try this one. All right, um, thanks for coming. My name is Ed Benowitz. I work um, on various Mars rover projects for the Jet Propulsion Lab. And uh, my co-author, Mark Maimon, is uh, responsible for doing quite a bit of patching throughout the history of uh, our Mars rover. So much of the credit goes to him. So today, I'm going to talk about some patching work we've done on various Mars rovers. First, I'll discuss. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity, um, those were the ones that uh, landed on Mars in the airbags. And then I'll talk about the Curiosity rover mission, and that's the one that came down on a jetpack and a string. Um, give you a little bit of an overview of our uh, flight software, and then we'll start diving into um, different ways you might change flight software in flight. Some of the goals for patching, I'll go over some general patching approaches and discuss some trades and um, go over how a typical image is loaded in, in general and then we'll go through some of the patch scenarios we actually did in flight and we'll close it all out by hopefully uh, having some lessons learned and then uh, happy to take your questions. So the Spirit mission, um, they were designed to last only 90 days and uh, Spirit is still going for six plus years on Mars. Um, we had a stalled wheel, but that uh, led to some serendipitous discoveries. And, um, you know, they've been there for six years, um, but flight software patches uh, help them going, help them keep going. Uh, so Opportunity is now in its 12th year, um, holds a distance record for driving on a planet. And it has been through six major updates of um, flight software and uh, quite a number of patches as well. So they've been, um, they've been going over under quite a few changes over time. So uh, they're about the size of a golf cart. Um, the arm can reach for three feet and they weigh about 400 pounds. And um, the mission was to sort of um, find the water, hold clues for past water activity on Mars. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about the Curiosity rover. Um, that was the one I, I worked on. That was my first mission. Um, this diagram here shows there's quite a few um, experiments on board. Uh, it actually has a laser. It can uh, zap a rock and determine the chemical composition of that rock from a distance. It's got an onboard weather station. Uh, quite a number of cameras uh, on the arm. It actually has a drill so it can um, turn a rock into a bit of powder and then put it uh, using the arm onto an onboard science laboratory and actually um, do some experiments and discover the chemistry of the rock that way. Um, all right, so here's a, an actual selfie um, taken by Curiosity on Mars. And you can actually see some of the uh, scoops in the ground that it, it did. Um, this one's a bit bigger. This one was about the size of a small car. Its arm could reach seven feet. This is 2,000 pounds. And this, you know, like I said before, was the one with the onboard chemistry lab to search for um, conditions favorable for life. All right. Um, so, the flight software, we've had a, kind of a similar architecture on uh, many of our Mars missions, and both uh, MER and MSL were quite similar in that respect. Um, they all ran the VxWorks operating system, and we'll note that that um, has a, a shell where you can actually go in and change the value of variables um, at runtime. And you can also, at the shell, um, type in the name of a function and execute it. Um, and you can also do a dynamic uh, code loading. So keep all those features in mind because we're going to be using them in the future uh, part of this presentation. Um, 
MSL itself has over 100 flight software modules. Um, and in both paradigms, uh, a module typically consists of a single task. And if I can give you uh, three letters to describe the architecture, it's IPC. Um, pretty much the architecture is sending messages back and forth via message queue, and we try to avoid other forms of um, synchronization in the code, such as semaphores, and just use the queue as our means of synchronization and communication between the module. So typically, you'll send a message request out to another module and then wait for a reply back. Um, and this just shows uh, two messages being sent and getting the replies back there. All right, so now we'll move on a little bit more towards changing flight software. Um, so there's several options, right? You could uh, brute force uplink an entire new flight software image to your spacecraft. So that's, that's one way to go. Um, Another one is to patch an existing flight software image that's already on board. So um, you might modify or poke some bits in an existing flight software image. Um, yet another way is that you might actually upload new code and link it in with the existing code on board as dynamically loading uh, new code. So if you're <clears throat> familiar with Windows, for example, this is similar to a DLL or a, a .so in the Linux community uh, in VxWorks, or we call them .os, um, but it's basically adding new code, uh, we could, which might even include new commands, new telemetry, uh, new data products, and some you know, pre-planning is required um, using some API, and we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. So, so why even bother patching? Um, some reasons could be you want to add entirely new functionality to the flight software. Um, this could include, as we said before, new commands, new telemetry. Um, there may be a new hardware behavior that wasn't anticipated, so you may need to work around that, perhaps degraded hardware, or um, perhaps some uh, new capabilities to increase the science return. Another reason to patch is to fix a flight software bug. Um, and there's some interesting discussion on this, potentially, um, and we can debate this, but potentially patching could be a faster process if you're only gonna do V and V around that specific change you're making. Um, you may be able to get away with that and not do a complete V and V on every single flight software capability. Um, so that's something to consider and debate. So some general um, approaches for doing a patch, and we're going to call one set the, the hot patch. Um, and that is your flight software is already running, and you're um, changing code in RAM while the code is running. Um, and as I said before, one of the things that helps, helps you do this is that VxWorks allows dynamic loading of .o files. Um, another possibility is the cold patch. And in that scenario, you're, you're going and modifying the flight software image. Um, your flight software image is going to be stored in some non-volatile storage area. And so you're not changing the code that you're currently running, but you're changing the code that's going to run after you boot up. So you're essentially kind of like a Windows update. You're updating the files, and then you have to reboot afterwards for the new uh, code changes to take effect. And there are some you know, trades involved with um, both. The, the advantage of a hot patch is that it's somewhat easier to uninstall, right? Because you're, you're kind of loading it as you boot up. And so if that patch is only in RAM, if you take a reset, you come up again, now your patch is no longer there, um, and you come back to a clean version. So that's something to consider. Uh, another point to consider is how much testing effort is going to be for the hot patch versus the cold patch, and also what is the size of your uplink going to be um, looking like. Uh, that's another trait to consider. Um, so patches, here's some possible techniques. There are many tools in the tool belt. Um, but here's some things they mean, may need to do. Uh, a patch may actually need to add code to an existing function, right? So that would, in turn, increase the size of the function. Okay, So that's, that's one challenge to consider. 
Um, in fact, you may want to replace a buggy function with a completely new function. Perhaps uh, some code needs to be removed, right, which would potentially make the function smaller, depending how you do it, or you may want to use no ops. Uh, new glo global variables may need to be added. And of course, um, if the change involves pointers to global variables, um, you have to be careful to um, update those if you're going to be changing locations of some global variables. So that's a, another subtlety. So changing references. And we also need, we need to add new commands and telemetry. And of course, whenever you do something as fun and exciting as patching flight software on Mars, it's always good to have a backup plan on how to uninstall the patch. So uh, that's something that should be considered. <coughs> okay, um, so some more talk about trades. And this is uh, definitely something that we had some thoughts about um, on our missions. Um, both the uh, MER rovers and MSL had some support for patches. Now on MER, um, you could apply plaid patches on top of a copy of flight software in RAM and then write it to non-volatile storage. Now MSL was slightly different. Um, MSL did have a command for adding a new flight software component, so something that was dynamically loaded, but um, that was for new code. So hot patches that are going to change existing code on MSL pretty much all had to be done through backdoor methods. So even between the two missions, there was a, a change of approach. Um, here are some issues that we had to deal with when you know, deciding whether or not to provide a built-in um, patching capability. One is you know, the effort you expend in uh, developing this new flight software patching capability takes away your development resources from actually making the software work. So that's, that's a trade you have to make right there. And if you have limited development resources, you're trading that against ops resources, where ops may have a different mix of personnel available to um, make a patch happen in a backdoor way. So that's, that's a trade, flight software resources versus ops resources. Um, now, another pitfall to consider is that even making a one-line change um, in the C code can result in a huge difference in the size and the impact on the flight software binary. Um, for example, if memory locations move, right, any address that's, that's looking, sorry, any pointer that's looking at that address is not changed. And um, that has a snowball effect. So that's something to, to worry about. <clears throat> now, one way to um, address that somewhat is to add padding to your flight software image in various locations. So um, if you have the space, say, at the end of every module, you can add a little bit of extra space in your flight software image. And with the hope that if you need to patch, you need to grow that one module, maybe you won't have that snowball effect and it wouldn't affect all the modules after it in the image. Um, now, that's, the problem is that's going to eat up some of your RAM. So again, there's a trade there. Um, on MSL, we're quite tight on memory. And so we considered it, but we did not have really the space to add this padding. Um, and so that was one of the drivers behind not um, having a built-in uh, explicit patch capability. Now, MER was an older mission and, and probably just a tad bit less ambitious in terms of the flight software code size. So um, they actually did room, have room to add the padding, and so that was some of the impetus for uh, having the ability to, to, to have some explicit patching um, built into their software patching capability. Um, here's an example of some of the patch differences. Um, if you imagine this is the size of the whole flight software image, and red is saying, at least one bit change. So it's, um, this is pretty substantial. What we're talking about, pretty substantial change uh, for a patch. 
Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on how MSL boots, and then we can use this to see what's different about how it's going to um, boot and load software in the patch scenarios. Um, so in a normal scenario, um, we have several NOR banks, which is our non-volatile storage for flight software image. Um, we come up, we copy the flight software image from NOR to RAM, and then we execute the image from RAM. And if a particular image fails to load, um, then the bootloader will move us over to a different NOR bank. And so we can have a few different flight software images <coughs> stored in NOR um, and swap between them as necessary. Okay, so that's all the nominal, um, the nominal scenario. Um, MERV was slightly different, but pretty close. Uh, their images were stored in double EEPROM. And again, multiple different flight software images could be stored there. So different flight computer, but similar um, architecture if you think about it. Okay, and here's how um, a new complete image, remember this is one of the ways we can patch is to just upload a completely new image. And so here's how it works. You take your binary image on the ground, um, send it up to the spacecraft, and then you send a command to the spacecraft. Um, so the new command is going to uh, load the flight software image into RAM, and then it's going to burn it into a NOR zone. Now in MER, it, this is where the patching capability came in. After it loaded the um, after it loaded a nominal um, flight software image into RAM, it could be uh, modified before being burned into its double EEPROM. Okay, so that was an additional thing Mer had. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some actual fun patching scenarios we did on MSL. So, one of the things we had to do was remove code. Um, we had a bug that affected both cruise and service operations, and we had to remove several lines of code. Now, as we're cruising to Mars, the spacecraft is always on. Um, and so basically that way, we, in that case, when we're in cruise, we chose to go with the hot patch approach. So we just poke some changes to the code in RAM only, um, replace the original code with um, no ops. And this was just basically a simple memory assignment that we, which we could do from the um, VxWorks shell. So that was pretty much the hot patch. Now, on the surface, our behavior is a little bit different. We wake up and shut down every um, Martian evening and go to sleep. So um, that hot patch would have gotten erased the first night we went to sleep. So that would not work so well on surface. So for surface, we took the cold patch approach. We actually went and changed the image in NOR. So we loaded the original image into RAM, and this was a bit of a backdoor, but we did um, modify the RAM image to add the no ops, and then we uh, issued a command to save the newly modified NOR image, uh, sorry, the newly modified RAM image into NOR. And at that point, our image is now saved, and the next time, and every time afterwards, we reboot, um, it's gonna have those no ops in it. And that was actually done. All right, so that's that scenario. <clears throat> um, in another scenario, we actually needed to add code to a function to uh, fix a bug. And to, so because the function size is going to get bigger here, um, right? it's not a matter of simply uh, erasing and replacing. So what we actually had to do is, um, instead of changing individual instructions, um, one or two, we're replacing an entire function. So this is implemented as a hot patch. Basically, we created a new uh, .o, which could be dynamically loaded by VxWorks. And it contains a replacement function. But not only that, it also contains pointers to global variables. Because the trick is, um, the function we're trying to replace references global variables. Um, so we need to deal with that. And um, what we did was, we loaded the .o, we had to find the address of the old function first. Then we changed the old 
function. So instead of doing its old incorrect behavior, it's going to jump into the newly loaded function. Then what we need to do is find the address of this global variable that the old function was referencing and assign them to the new pointers that are referenced by the new function. Okay. So now the new function knows about the global variables and it's going to get jumped to. So now we are OK. So all of this um, patching goodness is now done every time we boot up by a sequence. And so this is, this is a fully uh, warm patch. It takes place just at the beginning of our boot. All right. Um, now that was changing a function. And now I'm going to discuss sort of a new thing, which is completely adding new functionality. So MSL was designed um, so that we can upload a new .o, and it can contain new codes, new commands, and new telemetry. And um, we have done this. The, the key to the architecture in the software is to add uh, dynamic registration functions. So the new .o is loaded during the uh, boot process. And the new code <coughs> registers new commands, telemetry, and data products so that the commanding system knows how to route commands for this new, uh, new functionality. For example, the new code can hook into the existing wake up and shutdown process, so it's a full participant in the system. This registration is only uh, performed once. It's stored in our non-volatile memory. So every time we come up, the new dot is automatically loaded, automatically registered, and the new functionality exists. And um, again, this is still with the existing flight software image, but dynamic loading is used uh, to advantage here. <clears throat> All right, so some lessons learned. On MSL, we did have to use these backdoor methods to change small parts of existing flight code. Um, and you know, as you saw, we didn't have a lot of RAM margin to add the buffering. Um, so we did provide functionality to um, completely update a new image the whole thing. And we did provide functionality to add new components, new commands. Um, it was painful to do this um, onboard small code changes. And it was frequent enough that uh, we'd recommend considering that feature for future missions. And um, we, we can expect that now during nominal operations, um, running hot patch sequences is actually become a standard part of our uh, operating procedure. Um, so it, it continues to this day. So um, again, special thanks to my co-author, Mark Maimone. Um, he's the man responsible for patching quite a few Mars rovers. So thanks to him for being my co-author on this. Also wanted to thank the entire MSL Flight Software team, led by Ben and uh, Danny Lamb also helped with the history on this one. And uh, Mark wanted to thank um, the team, flight software team on MER, led by Glenn Reeves. So thanks to all the teams that helped uh, make the patching happen. And I'm happy to take questions. Who wants to shuffle the mic around? Um, well, I'm one of those software developers that cringe when you talk about hot patches and <laughs> IV and V and how much V and V you can do on a patch and everything. But my experience with the NESC has turned that around a bit. There's this happy tension. For example, if you need a really quick patch to support the astronauts on the space station and you have to get it done in three days, then you have to balance that with how much you can actually test on the particular patch you have. Um, also, I think another thing is if you go with a lot of patches, one of the things, we're, if we talk about the patch individually, that's one thing. But if you have a lot of hot patches that if you do reboot, you have to put in patch one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in that order again before you can actually operate the vehicle, um, that's how Clementine uh, didn't, didn't succeed around the moon. Um, they had, some, they, the ops f was so stressed, they never were able to actually rewrite the software to upload it so they had a series of patches and they missed one of them on one of their boot missions and it left the thrusters on and it ran out of fuel around the moon 
so there's these balances when, I, like I said, I cringe when I hear about hot patches, but now I realize there are instances where every one of these techniques makes sense. And I think there's also something where when you get into ops, you need to have some kind of hard line that says, we have this many hot patches that we have to deal with, we've got to write, rewrite the software. Somehow you have to squeeze that in so you can reset that so that you're not dealing with this every time you reboot. Right, I, I completely agree. In fact, um, that has happened where we've had a few flight software patches and then after a certain point we say, okay, we're gonna roll up our patches in with a bunch of other bug fixes and do a new flight software upload and that's happened multiple times. And the other thing is I agree with it. It's, it's very important to be um, conservative in terms of what you decide to patch and do a thorough job testing and eventually, right, if it gets to be a certain number, then yeah, draw the line and roll it up into a new flight software build. I think that makes a lot of sense and I agree, I agree with you, yeah. Hi, right, that was a fun presentation. Um, it wasn't clear to me. How are you finding the addresses of global variables and functions? Are you, do your .os have debug symbols in them or are you using another method? Um, let's see. So VXWorks provides a symbol table so you can find the addresses of um, global variables by name. That is one way. The other way is to look at your flight software map file. So there are multiple methods. Uh, could you address your back out procedures for your hot patch? Well, the nice thing about a hot patch, right, is that they are loaded by sequence, right? And so if you take a reboot and go into saving, your sequences don't run. And so the hot patch just goes poof and doesn't load anymore. Uh, well, how about core patch things? Right, so there are multiple NOR zones, right? So, and they have different versions of flight software. So if you corrupt one NOR zone or the hardware goes bad, then you autonomously would go into another NOR zone which has a different version of flight software on it. Yep. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, what is your average turnaround time from recognizing the need for a patch to pushing it through V&V &V, and do you suspend <laughs> a portion of V&V &V in an emergency situation? I imagine that's probably the case, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, the one I have experience on was probably on the order of nine months. Now that wasn't continuously working on it. We all had many other jobs and many other tasks to work on, but um, that's a ballpark figure. Are your NOR images com compressed? That's a good question. Um, the question is, you said you would load it, load it, patch it in RAM, and then store it. It must be extra hard if you have to patch a compressed version compared to. Uh, I, I think not, but I'm, I'm not absolutely sure on that one. OK, thank you. Could you just explain the ConOps for why you would do that warm patch where you want to do it every single time you reboot, but you're not actually going to write it into a NOR zone? Right, so uh, it's a balancing act, right? Um, there's, there's, in a certain sense, there's less risk to a warm patch um, in that you have a very easy escape path, right? You reboot, it goes away. So that's, that's, that's one justification in some sense. Um, and again, there's, there's the, another aspect to consider is testing effort and different organizations may disagree about how much a warm patch, which only affects a certain portion of flight software, may need to be tested against a complete new flight software build. There may also be time constraints. Um, work effort to consider in putting together those two may be different. Um, it's a trade. I can't say that one's necessarily better than the other all the time. Yeah. Oh. Now that's, uh, I can address the compression, at least at Goddard missions, at least on recent ones, we use the uh, EEPROM file system, and we do compress a lot of images, but then we just load the whole compressed image using our, fi our file, file manager. So that simplified things a lot. And actually, that's been, APL uses that same file system and we've released it as open source so we should be able to get it out to people if they're interested. So 
We'll take one more question. We are about 30 minutes or so late. But that's all right. <coughs> yeah, I'm curious about, uh, especially with V&V, &V, uh, configuration management of all of these hot patches and different NOR zones and, and everything like that. Does your V&V &V sequences run through certain combinations of the hot patches and loading di different old NOR zones? You know, maybe you woke up that morning and had a corrupted flash system, you know, what? how does that work from the testing side? Um, yes, the, when we have multiple patches interacting, um, their test program has to cover loading with the other patch present, loading without the other patch present. Um, luckily, the common networks have been pretty good so far because we only have a few. But yes, that is the case. We, we do go run through that. And all sorts of scenarios, really, all sorts of crazy. I mean, I even ran a test where I, I made a dot O that purposely is corrupted and see how the system reacts to it to make sure we know our you know safing procedure and all that yeah so thank you Eddie all right. thank you